Hey guys, welcome back. I'm going to try to blast through this as quick as possible because I don't have a lot of time. We're going to basically follow up on the instrument cluster for the rollback truck today. i got a few other things to get through, uh, but I ordered some parts from Summit. We'll talk about that in a second. I got a whole box full of hardware here for the Cub Cadet lawnmower. So, you know, hold on for a future video on that. I also ordered some parts from the dealer. I haven't got those yet. So once everything comes in, we will get a follow up there. And then I got my first kind of viewer mail type of a submission here. So I thought we could open that up and take a look at it. And off the hop, I'd say there's no way that it was packed by a man. Looks like there might have been some female intervention. So it looks like we got a card here. And it says, Wes, thanks for loan of the piloting tool. We appreciate your valuable knowledge and experience, your kindness, helping us achieve our dream. The F-244 runs great. Thanks again. Yeah, eat chip. So, the deal here is uh, I had a fellow contact me. I believe his YouTube name is eChip. chip I will attempt to link to his channel. He had a backhoe, I believe made by Dynaho. And it used a Continental engine, a 244. And he asked me if he could borrow the pilot driving tool that I used, the valve guide driving tool that I made for the F245 that I rebuilt. That's it right there. I said no problem, stuck it in a box and shipped it out to him. And a few months later, he sent it back. I told him to just throw it in the trash because I could make another one or I'd probably forget I had this one by the time I got around to it, but he was nice enough to send it back along with some homemade jam. So looking forward to eating that and thank you very much. All right, next order of business, the circuit board from the old instrument panel. A couple guys were asking some questions about this. Uh, Perry, eFormance Engineering, he mentioned that possibly there was a problem with the reset pin on this, this microprocessor and then I could short power to the reset pin or ground to the reset pin and maybe I could overcome those problems. I attempted both of those. It had no effect. So I think that whatever's going on with it, it's beyond my capability to diagnose. And you know, any of the other problems that are associated with it, you know, I just don't know how to make heads or tails of it. Like I said, the tack was working intermittently. The backlighting has never worked. And then all of a sudden I lost everything. So. I just, without some more service information for this board, I don't think there's any way I can fix it. And, yeah. If somebody out there wants to give it a shot, I will happily send it to you, but I think it's a lost cause. So next up, uh, Brian Block, he mentioned that maybe a connector would be a good idea, just in case I had to service the dash or whatever, make it easier to pull it in and out. I agree, that is a good idea. Purchased this 12-pin connector from Summit. It wears the name Painless but I guarantee you that this is actually a Molex connector. Uh, anyway, CNC machines and you know machine tools in general chock full of Molex connectors, so I just happen to have a full set of Molex pin crimping tools, so we can easily accomplish installing a connector. I also purchased a double pull switch for the headlights. The one that's in the truck doesn't work correctly. It's supposed to be, if you push it down, it's the marker lights. If you push it up, it's marker lights and headlights. On the, for whatever reason, they have installed a second switch for the headlights and only used the, the old double pull switch for the marker lights. So I want to get rid of all that. And finally, I had a sharp viewer whose name I did not write down, but I will attempt to type down here. Commented that there is a product from Dakota Digital that can overcome my issues with the TAC and the TAC sensor. So in, on my truck, the TAC sensor is a, a magnetic pickup style sensor that runs right off of the ring gear of the flywheel. So I said it was 80 pulses. According to the manual, it's actually 103 pulses per revolution. That's how many teeth are on the flywheel gear. Anyway, this little doohickey here, DSL-1E, is designed specifically for that issue. So here's the instructions here. And according to this, I should be able to program in the number of teeth on the flywheel and make this thing spit out a signal 
that is more manageable for the VDO tachometer to read. So I'm going to give it a shot. Kind of spendy. It's about 60 bucks for this little unit right here. But I think it's better than running it off the alternator because, you know, let's say we had to replace the alternator at some point and now it doesn't have a tack output. You know, we got to run new wires. I hate running wires and altering the factory wiring harness. So we're going to try to use this little unit right here. Cool. All right, guys. I think I got it working. We're just going to fine tune it here. I put a piece of reflective tape on the front pulley. I'm going to use my photo tack to fine tune the tack. It says 673 RPM. I think we're right on the money. Good deal. There's a little unit right there. So all I got to do is mount it permanently and we're good to go. So I just followed the instructions here, the setup instructions, pretty much directly from this page. And everything seemed to work out just right. So all you got to do is just set the, go to this setting here, the output setting, and it puts out a 2,000 RPM signal. And then you just calibrate your tack to 2,000 RPM using the, the pot on the tack itself. And then you go through the flywheel setup here and input the number of teeth and calibrate everything and it should come out just right as long as you know the number of teeth. And there's plenty of ways to fine tune it. The only thing that I had to do that was a little bit maybe beyond the normal setup here. I had to go into the advanced setup here and go to this 519 setting and change the input setting to low because the the magnetic pickup for the on the flywheel it only puts out about I don't know maybe three volts total so like a volt and a half positive and a volt and a half negative so I just switched it from high to low and then the, the unit was able to pick up the signal from that sensor. Otherwise it was giving me no output. And I, I suspected that was the deal. So I think if you have a if you're running it off an alternator, you know, that puts out 14, 15 volts, you'd have to have the high input. But I've got that, you know, induction style sensor, so I needed the low. So otherwise, it seems to work just fine. So that's pretty cool. Well, I don't know what happened here guys. Somehow I had figured on a 12 pin connector being enough. And that is not the case. I need at least 18 pins in order to put this whole thingamajig on a Molex connector like this. So I don't know how I miscalculated that. But for whatever reason, I did. Which means I'll hook up the 12 wires I can hook up. And the rest of them are going to have to wait until I get the right connector. Oh, you probably can't see this. So this is where having the correct crimp tool really pays off. You know, they make a, a non-ratcheting style crimp tool for these open barrel connectors, but it doesn't work very well. It really is nice to have the correct tool. And, you know, technically they're supposed to be calibrated and all that crap, but for what I'm doing it doesn't really matter. So, that's one, but we're going to have to wait for the other one. Alright guys, take one last look at the instrument panel. She's going in. I went ahead and cleaned up the rat's nest, and I don't think it looks too bad. So I do need to get that one other plug. It's, I think it's actually made by Amp, not Molex, but whatever, pretty much the same thing. So I'll get one of those. But otherwise, I don't see why we can't throw this in, and then we'll test the speedometer. Alright, we gotta wait for traffic to clear. And then as soon as we get next to this sign post right here, we're gonna hit the button. Eventually the light will change, but it just takes forever. Yeah, we're gonna have to 
stop. Now, if I read the directions right, it should start working on its own. Let's find out. Stopped up here at the forklift dealer. They pronounced their name Wheezy. I think it should be pronounced Visa, but what are you gonna do? Anyway, they got this rollback here built on a Sterling chassis. And it's a nice truck. I had them move that big forklift, the one that I did the you know the big ugly forklift project. They used this truck to move that. What I really like about this one is it has this dock leveling system on the back. So this foot comes down to support the back of the truck while the bed's you know rolling off. But also you can use those hydraulic cylinders to, to lift the whole back of the of the the whole tail section of the of the bed up so you can load right off of a dock. You know, a lot of times docks have different heights. These guys move forklifts all day, so they want to be able to move the load the forklifts directly off the dock instead of having to winch them up on the deck. The only thing I don't like is that they put this all this expanded metal on top of their of their deck. And their deck is metal too, it's not wood, like mine is. But this is a nice setup. I think it's a 20,000 pound winch. Ramsey. Got the nice chain rack there. Plus I got the wells here for the chains. And then I like these anchor points here. They use those all the time. So it's built a little different than mine. It uses channel iron instead of the mini I-beams for the cross members. And then it's it's some kind of soft wood here. So there's some kind of soft wood underneath of the metal. Yeah, it looks like the cross members are on 8 inch centers. That's a nice setup. Air ride. Yeah. If I ever rebuild my rollback deck, this is how I'm going to do it. A pretty similar setup. They got the big lift cylinders right here to tilt the deck up. But it's just a whole lot more civilized than what I have. So, anyway, back to the shop.
All right, fellas, everything seems to be working. So I think we better quit while we're ahead. The buzzer is extremely loud, so I may look into muffling that. Either I'll put something over top of it or I'll just put a small resistor in line, you know, something to drop the current a little bit. But for now, it's fine. And like I said, I got to replace that one, you know, install that one connector anyway. So I will have it back apart, but for now, everything seems to be functioning. So it's all good. I stopped down at the station, got a little bit of fuel. Truck's running good. So yeah, I'm all set for tomorrow morning. I got to peel out of here early, headed for Rockford to pick up a Okuma LB25 CNC lathe. I'm going to be moving for a guy. So maybe I'll bring you guys along for that. Uh, a couple guys were asking about this hour meter and if I was going to install that into the panel. I don't think so. I think I'm just going to get rid of it. Yeah, it's not necessary anyway. So the hour meter is kind of nice for, for trucks that have a lot of PTO hours or a lot of idle time. So like, you know, like utility trucks, you bucket trucks or crane trucks or whatever that are, that are stationary and, and using the PTO a lot. This truck, it shouldn't get that many PTO hours. So, you know, now that we have a working odometer, I think the mileage is, is more important than the hour meter. So, plus I don't like the way that they installed this thing. I actually hit my knee on it. So, anyway, I'm just going to get rid of it and, uh, yeah, go back to the way it was. So, thanks everybody for watching.